it was at first a little daunting to direct, but then to look around and see the people who have, who have gone through such a history with me, personally, professionally, therapeutically, and to have them just support me by being there, no questions asked, it was so comforting. And I love my friends for doing this for no money at all. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Unroute Podcast. I'm your host, Emily Vogel. And of course, we have Andy Ortiz. Hi, friends. Hello, Andy. How are you doing on this lovely day? I'm doing very well. It is like really, really nice weather. We're in that we're in that yo-yo in Chicago. So we did our cold and now we're doing our very, very warm. It's like 70 degrees outside. I'm really excited to walk my dog today. So I am doing very well. How are you, Emily? What have you been doing lately? I'm doing good. I mean, speaking of dogs, my sister just got a dog this weekend, so I am full on puppy anti mode, and I am loving life. I I'm loving. Feel like you haven't sent me enough photos. I've been living through your Instagram story, which if you don't follow, you probably should at Emily Vogel, please, because she's posting puppy pics, and they're the best. It's it's what like a little Bernice, right? A little or a Bernice mountain dog. It's a Cavapoo. Cavapoo. I was super incorrect. Regardless, <laughs> that Cavapoo is cute as poo. It's really really cute. I love it a lot. What is his um, name? So yeah, I, uh, but, well, oh, Otis. It's Otis. You're a bad dog, Aunt. I'm just getting so excited. I, all the all the pictures of him in my head are just floating around with so much love. Um, so that's what, what I've been up to the past week is hanging out with the pup. What about you? Honestly, I envy that. I've been hanging out with my own dog, but not as much as I should be. I was actually I was hanging out with a friend yesterday. She lives about an hour from me. So I drove out to see her. So we're going to Disney. We're going to Disney World in a couple of months here to celebrate my birthday, which ironically we talk about in this episode uh if, I, if i'm gonna have a crisis i'm gonna have it in disney world so we did like a pre-disney disney day so we just watched a bunch of disney movies so we watched something called cat women of the moon which is not a disney movie but at disney world there's this restaurant it's called like the sci-fi drive-in theater the tables are in fake cars so it's like a drive-in theater and they just show clips of like really old movies and one of them was cat women of the moon and my friend is such a cat person she was like can we please watch this this was two years ago. We decided to watch it. So it took us a long time to get to it. But we watched that. It was weird. It, I mean, it's the 50s. So like it was odd. We watched uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. We watched Enchanted and we watched Princess of the Princess and the Frog. So it was a good day for um, Andy. I'm thriving. Love. They're also doing a Pirates of the Caribbean. Another one. Are they like I I asked Jerry Bruckheimer about this like a while ago and he said it's definitely still like a priority. I think he said they've got two versions going because there is a Margot Robbie version like floating around in the ether. I don't I I need updates on this. I desperately need updates on this. I need a Margot Robbie pirate movie like I need pizza every day of my life. I'm and not... I think Ayo Debiri is involved as well. Oh, I don't she... know if that's Ooh. the same one. Ooh. I don't know if it's the same one. Now I'm Ayo. getting confused. But Hang I on. love that. Hang on. Ayo Debiri as a pirate is inspired. Just give me more female pirate movies. That's kind of what I want here is I want more female pirate movies. This could be a rumor, but I'm I'm pretty sure I've I've seen I've seen and read some stuff. Is this something so. that you made up and you're just trying to get started as a rumor? I support you. I'm I just, just trying to know. This is how this is how I manifest things. I just you know, put them out into the headlines. Um I respect it. I do. Today we have an amazing woman joining us. She's just been in so many amazing classics. Speaking of throwbacks, she's been in some of the best throwback movies. I love her in general, but I love her work when she was just starting out. But Emily, you go ahead. You know which movies I love. Uh, Tell them about it. Oh, we love Hairspray. We, we love. love We love Hairspray. John Tucker Must Die. All the pitch perfects. Like She is a force to be reckoned with. And now she is taking a role behind the camera. The film is called Parachute, The Amazing Britney Snow. Having a directorial debut for a full-length feature is incredible in itself, but this story is based off of her own personal experience with her eating disorders, with her mental health struggles, and it premiered at South by Southwest earlier this year, and I highly recommend watching it. It is truly incredible, but for her to not only direct this film, but to have it be such a personal film and story for her, I am just completely blown away and i'm so lucky we were able to talk to her about it yes i so yeah play it just play it just go just go i think i think it's done Brittany snow hello and welcome to unwrapped we start every interview the same way and it's one very important question how are you today genuinely how are you doing because the world is a mess so how are you Ooh, this is good i am very grateful i'm a little overwhelmed and i've i've 
I think it's because Mercury is in retrograde, supposedly. They're always like, Mercury is retrograde. I'm like, when did it ever get out? It's been in there for years. I feel like everything that could have gone wrong today has gone wrong a little bit, unraveled in a weird, not in a bad way, but just like little, little things, technological things and, and whatnot. So um, I'm a little overwhelmed. But other than that, I'm very good. How are you guys? Listen, I was telling Emily, I my body is just sort of done with this week. Like, I just sort of feel like I'm dying. My jaw hurts. I'm exhausted. Like, I'm sick, but not sick. I'm just, I'm really kind of crawling to the finish line here. So that well, but also, Friday. I'll sneak in some positive. It's the weather is getting nicer. So I'm in Chicago. So we are creeping towards spring. So like, things are moving in a positive direction, at least for me. Oh God. Good, good. And it's almost the weekend. So you're so close. Yes, exactly. Emily, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm really excited to be chatting today. I was talking to Andy earlier as well of just, you know, I've just had a really bad body image week. And we were talking about, she was talking about how she turns 30 this year. I was talking about how I recently turned 30. And all of a sudden, it's like, I tried on pants this week for my for spring and pants I had didn't fit me. And I started seeing gray hairs. And I'm like, oh my gosh, everything was unraveling. So I'm just really happy we get to chat. And I enjoyed your film so much. So I'm excited to dive deeper into that um thank you so welcome welcome to our podcast. you guys are you guys are 30 okay. i'm turning 30 in june and i'm one of those girls that's having a crisis about it i'm okay. going to celebrate in disney world because i figured if there's anywhere i'm gonna have this crisis disney world is the place to do it i don't want to invalidate your feelings because they are very real and true and i had them as well when i turned 30 but but the, but it's 30 you're you're so you're you, you guys are crash. It's going to be okay. I'm like, I'm with like my only friend who's not married. A bunch of my friends are on their second kid. I'm well, super yes. single. Everyone's like, so when are you settling down? And I'm like, I can't fit my pants on. I can't get a text back. So I'm just like, what's happening? I'm supposed to be married by now. Like, oh, girl, well, uh, never mind. I was about to say something, but I won't. Um, You're fine. You can say whatever you want, girl. <laughs> Feel free to speak. No, I'm just, you know, it's okay that you haven't been married yet because you could be on your next one, like me, you know, or whatever. You know? Everything I feel like happens for a reason. And even though I feel like sometimes it seems like the worst thing in the world, when you look back, you're like, that was horrible, but I wouldn't be where I am without that happening first. So sometimes I try to think about it like that, where hopefully one day I'll look back and be like, you know what? It was good that I was single and that. I didn't fit into those pants at that time. So we'll see how it all. What's it like to have what? a healthy mindset? Because Yeah, yeah. Really what? Um, also, I, I, I'm I, glad that you said that because sometimes I do need to put that into perspective too where it's so ever-changing. The pants, the relationship, the time thing. A month from now, you could be swimming in the pants and swimming in dates. You don't know. So it's so it's so you know relative to to time and who knows what's about to happen around yeah. every corner and I feel like also too because I also your call her daddy episode just came out and I listened to that and my therapist has been trying to get me to just pause and stay still and not seek external validation so when I my pants didn't fit and I was crying I was like typically I would just call my mom and be like I'm fat like do you still love me or you know be on my phone or look at old photos and try to compare myself but I literally just like sat there and I had never done this before, but I started just journaling. Um, another uh, guest on our podcast recommended that I just started writing just down everything and it did actually work in the feeling past. And that was actually like once I heard someone else did it and it worked for you just to kind of sit there and just let these hard feelings pass. You know, Ty went on in the next morning. I was like, I'm still here. I'm still alive. Like I didn't need to call my mom to make sure she still loved me. Like I'm still OK. Isn't that funny how it, but that's really interesting that you make that sort of pipeline association with wanting to make sure that your mom still loved you. Because to be honest, I think at the core of what we're going through, it's that like, does someone still love me? Am I still safe? Am I still okay? Which is so interesting because when you break it down, it's like, it's just pants. But when, but really, if you, if you negate all that, it's, it's like, why do I feel alone? Why do I feel like abandoned? And sometimes when I don't get that external validation really quickly, I I check in with myself of like, am I really alone? Am I really unsafe? No, nothing has happened. Everything is the same. It's just my mind. And so it's so it's cool that you're aware that that was what you needed to reach out to do because you can also outthink that, to be honest. Brains are insane. That's all I have on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
first of all, congratulations on making your directorial debut. Like, that's such a Thank huge you. thing. And I hope that you are, even though you are overwhelmed, I hope you are basking in it because it is such an accomplishment and I'm so thrilled for you. And what Thank I you. loved about this movie was like little bits of you that came through. There was li like pieces of your voice that I spotted immediately. And one of them was the conversation at the very beginning about the serial killer trait. I know this. <laughs> yeah. I know that this is a theory that you have had for years. So yeah. I, one, I love that you slipped it in, but I want to know for you, like, what is, what's your serial killer trait? What is the one that freaks you out the most? Like, I love that this made it in the film. Right. The, it's always my go-to with pretty much everyone and everyone I've dated. I can, I can pretty much nail down or it's, it's always illuminating what people find their serial, ki serial killer trait is. Um, and I think I've been really trying. I mean, when I when I'm going through them, I have so I have so many. But now, of course, my mind blanks. Um, but oh, I I mean, I used to do things in in strange numbers. I had a thing with fours and sevens, where everything had to be in a four or a seven all the time. Um, I couldn't I couldn't do anything. That's originally why my movie was called September Seventeenth, is because I had this sort of number obsession where I, I felt like my life would make sense if it if it correlated with a number. Um, and I think that's a little bit OCD and also a serial killer trait. <laughs> that's a very real thing because my serial killer trait is 100% number based because my thing no. is, this is where I'm going to tell about my life. I When I do a puzzle, I love doing like jigsaw puzzles. But when yeah. I do a puzzle, when I find a piece that fits, this may be an OCD thing, it may be an ADD thing. Don't know. Uh, when I find a piece that fits, I have to put it in three times. Like, I can't just find it. It fits. I am put it in and I'm done. I have to take it out, put it back in two more times. Like, it has to be three more times. I've long been convinced that that is my serial killer trait. And it made me remember that when I watched your movie. Oh, that's so that's so interesting. I have those types of things, too. And I do think it all kind of correlates back to the safety thing because you initially you innately feel safer when you do this sort of ritual you know, association with your mind because that make, makes your brain make it make sense. And it feels completely out of control to not do that. So I, I totally relate. I have many things like that that I, I won't get into because I don't want to well, trigger anybody either. It might also be a control thing for me because it's one of those things where like I do it and then when I redo it, it like reassures me in a way that like I, I did this. I handled this. I fixed it. I made the yeah. thing work. So Maybe there's a deeper meaning there. I don't really know, but that is that is my serial killer trait. Emily, do you know what yours is? I don't know what mine is. I feel like I've ha I I've had a lot of those like number based words like okay, I'm gonna need three paper towels or this straighten my hair this amount of time or this amount of time. But throughout my life, it's it's sort of changed and it's been more of these moments of these obsessive thoughts have gone down. I, I'm I we Andy and I do a lot of therapy, but also. I also believe in medication. And so medication has been something where I'm like, wow, I can wake up and not go in a certain order of like, I have to wash my hair and then do this and then do that. I just do it how I'm feeling. But I'm like, in terms, that's not necessarily like a serial killer thing, but I definitely relate to these like number things of having to do things a certain yeah. amount of times. Well, by the way, a serial killer is sort of a broadened, hilarious. Broadened, you know? yeah. <laughs> yes. We're not all serial killers. <laughs> and everyone has these things. So if yeah. we were all serial killers, no one would be alive in the world yeah. because everybody does something weird. <laughs> yeah. Accurate. Uh, so one other thing I want to ask, obviously, because there's a lot of your voice in there and it, as it should be because you are the director, but there's a lot of familiar faces in here. There's a lot of people that you have worked with before. There's Kelly Jackal. There's Chrissy Fitt, Dave Batista, Gina Rodriguez, who, P.S., thanks for making her the therapist in the movie. There is something yeah. so innately comforting about Gina Rodriguez's like person that I was immediately soothed. It made me want more scenes with her. I get why there were not. I get why the therapy scenes were stilted. But having all these familiar faces around you, I'm curious, how did that help you making your directorial debut? I have to imagine there is like a level of comfort that they provide when you look around and you see friends on set. Oh, definitely. I mean, it was at first a little daunting to, to direct. But then once I started getting into... The groove of it and through osmosis i feel like i i knew things that i i'm not sure how i knew and to look around and see the people who have who have gone through such a history with me personally professionally therapeutically and to have them just support me by being there no questions asked it was such a i don't know i i, I was so humbled because i because i really felt like it 
infiltrated my mind on how to direct because I had people there that I knew I could draw from and the experiences that we had together. So it was so comforting. And I love my friends for doing this for no money at all in uh, like, like no money that the, we had no time, no money, no nothing. And, and they just, a couple of them signed on without even reading the script. And I can't thank them enough for that. Yeah. I love friends. Friends are so good and supportive and great. Yes, they really are. Sorry, I needed to bask in that for a moment. That was a really sweet thing. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> One thing I would also really love to know, the character that I really resonated here, ironically enough, was Ethan. Because friends. I, in in my high school years and in, in years past, I've had friends who went through very, very tough times. They struggled with some very significant issues. Things that at that age, like I was not equipped to handle. And obviously, Ethan kind of becomes like an unintentional enabler because he wants to like provide the comfort and and just make things better. But he also knows. And I feel like I fell into that in my life. I've become I, I was the person that just didn't know what to do, but wanted to do something. So I just did what I could. And that was always really hard. I, I would love to know for you, like, who was the hardest character to kind of find to write for to really craft and make sure that like you got them right it could was it all of them was it Courtney at the center like wh who was the one character for you I guess it would be Thomas's character Ethan Ethan um because when I was going through that that was definitely the person that I saw supporting me and helping me and I I, I held, held them up to such a high standard and I also was so grateful for them that I it was hard to see the cracks in that somewhat and then it wasn't until later that I realized that although seemingly altruistic it also comes from a place of needing the validation to be the savior in that way um and I have I have traits of that as well you know I think people get really uh addicted in their own right to to not knowing how to separate themselves from someone else and becoming obsessive about fixing that person. And if that person is fixed, then they get that sort of sense of control. Um, and I think that's a really nuanced thing to write about because it's so subjective and also differs from, from personal experience to, you know, everybody has a different example of that. So with this, I kind of drew from a lot of people that I not only the real person of Ethan, but de de definitely people I dated and friends of mine, um, family members of mine. I kind of took little pieces and a couple of the scenes are direct stories of things that happened that weren't the Ethan character that that happened from other people that I knew. Um, and so putting together that quilt in a way and making it all make sense was was more difficult than I think any other character. I think you did it so well, though. I loved his character. The, the second I was sold on his character, when he was like, you know what we should do? And then he built a fucking fort. Excuse my language, yeah. but it was a fucking fort. And it was good. Like, that is, that's 100% something I would do. So I, I really think you did that so well. Thank you. I'm glad that you realized and, and keyed in on that because I think something that was cut out of the movie, but I, I really wanted him to be the epitome um, or the encapsulation of a human hug. And so everything that Ethan was doing for her was to keep her safe and cozy within that insular and sort of small in a way which I think is a double-edged sword because you're you're also you're comforting them and you're giving them a hug but also keeping them in this sort of cycle and so that was symbolic and maybe no one picked that up but I was hoping that someone would or did <laughs> it was great in in terms of um keeping people safe and I know you mentioned working with such amazing friends and actors earlier I'm curious about the dialogues that happened on set in terms of mental health and making sure that you felt safe that Courtney felt safe that the actors and everyone involved felt safe and that their mental health was taken care of so that's a really good point we went into production with many many talks with my producers about how we were going to do that we gave the option to both Thomas and Courtney for therapy throughout the entire process because we wanted them to feel very, not only safe with their characters, but safe to leave it at work and not come home with any of the residual feelings, which I think is a huge, um, huge thing in terms of, I think a lot of actors don't know how to, and, and I am victim to this too, where I, I don't know sometimes how to leave it. I get very emotional when I get home. Um, and I think that we wanted to make sure that everyone on set was also really careful about language and 
saying anything triggering. And at the at the the forefront of my mind, I wanted to make sure that not only was not the cast and crew triggered in any way, but also anyone watching it. So we worked really closely with this um, eating disorder charity called the Alliance for Eating Disorders. And they looked at the script from pre-production to post, and they're working with us even now in press. And they really had a handle on the language or how things were worded, uh, if anything rang true uh, or false. And I think, and it was also as a resource when we were filming um, for anybody who was feeling triggered on set. But I really think that it was me and Courtney at the end of it all in our relationship that I think helped that so much. I think it was comforting that I came from a place of experience. And so it wasn't, I was not hoping to do anything gratuitous in any way or sensationalize it because that would be such a detriment to anyone going through it. And I think she trusted me on that. What do you think the industry could be doing better to do things like this um, to help navigate mental health on sets to normalize conversations both on screen and while filming i think i think these conversations are the starting point of that i think to normalize it in a lot of ways but i think that what is really unfortunate is that the eating disorder or the um, food addiction body dysmorphia or anything like that seemingly is in a different category than drug addiction alcoholism mental health um, in general. And I think it, um, I think it's really sad because I think they're very interconnected. And I think that they're all just different mechanisms of people not wanting to feel their feelings and using different things to disassociate from their body. And I think that, that if we can normalize the eating disorder conversation, just the same way that we do in movies with drug and alcohol addiction, and we're very open to talking about them. And if anything, they're like, very out in the world of movies and the zeitgeist of what people talk about. But this seems very taboo to a lot of people. And I would love to one day make sure that people realize that they're all in the same. And so people don't feel as shamed with this particular subject. I think a lot of people struggle with this, but they're afraid to talk about it because it's not as normalized. Mm -hmm. I agree. As someone who has suffered with an eating disorder my whole life, has gone through recovery, continues to be in recovery, I completely agree with with what you just said. And uh, there's one scene in particular too, or there's a f multiple scenes and multiple things throughout the film that I really resonated with. But one is when Ry the character Riley's in the mirror and she's calling herself pathetic and she's looking at herself. And th I felt like I was watching myself on the screen in that moment. And I feel like when I go back and I think about m the way that I talk to myself in that way, that it's like, weird or oh my god I should feel shame and I shouldn't talk to myself in that way but it was just interesting because I had never seen that on screen before which was really interesting but what was the hardest scene for you to film or were there triggers or anything you left out because it was too hard to face I think the hardest scenes to film for me were the the eating scenes the ones that were really and I purposely made them very dark in terms of color and tone um, because I do feel like it's a shadowed self and it's all well and good for people to hate themselves, but, but people don't like to see it acted out. They don't want to see the, the, the drug going into their body. They just want to hear you talking about it or shaming it. So although the circling of the body, that scene was really hard for Courtney and me to be a part of and, you know, made me cry every time she did it. To be honest, I feel like a lot of women go through that, but a lot of people, men and women, don't want to talk about how much we use substances to hurt ourselves in that way. And I tried to do that with social media, with the voicemails, with the cookie dough, with all these different things. They're interchangeable. The podcasts, there are all these different ways that she's using to, to masochistically hurt herself. And I think that's really hard for people to watch. And so it was really hard for me to do because I was opening myself up for people to realize, oh, I've hurt myself in more ways than just telling myself that I suck. But I would be hard pressed to find anyone that hasn't done something harmful to themselves uh, in some some way, whether that's over drinking or putting someone down or gossiping. But it's I think for some reason that scene was really, really difficult. 
Yeah. And I feel like there's so many things throughout, whether it was the use of photography, like I felt like that was me when I go back and I look at photos of myself when I'm like, oh, my God, I look so good and skinny and I look happy. And then I realize, oh, no, I really wasn't happy in those. I was a small brain or the way she's, you know, you're zooming in on her, how she's looking at different parts of people's bodies. I was like, that's my eyes. Like, I'm yeah, that's how I look. I'm so glad you picked up on that because I think a lot of people are really confused why I use pictures in the movie and I've gotten negative and positive feedback from that. But what I was trying to show with that was that I think a lot of times we remember not only memories, but we remember ourselves in these sort of singular things and they're not exactly the whole person. We're seeing only this part of our body that we hate or we're seeing only this one moment in time that was good. But we're not really mem- remembering everything or seeing ourselves as a whole person. And especially now with this generation where everything is a picture or everything is seen online, there's there's positive and negative to that. But I think we're losing the fact that we're human beings that are so much more than one singular part of ourselves. Completely. One moment I really, really want to ask you about is the fact that it it is something that doesn't happen in movies with that, like, cover heavy topics like this. She gets a really bracing reality check from multiple people saying, like, maybe you're the problem. You need to work your shit out. You need to get it together. And that was, I think, really, really great to include. I would love to know why you felt it was important to include. Right. Because I watched this movie ironically enough, on a day I was going to therapy. So I watched this movie and I went to my therapy appointment and my therapist has worked with people who have substance abuse problems. And I asked her, I was like, do you actually get blunt with patients like this? Like, is this a thing that you have to do? And so, and it was fascinating. I could go on a whole tangent about that. But from your perspective as a director, as a writer, why did you want to include that reality check? Why was it important to have those people saying to her, look, get it together. We love you. We cannot keep getting dragged down with you. Not only was that my experience, um, you know, when I was a teenager and in my early 20s before I got recovery, but I also think that what I really wanted to make sure I did with this movie was was the, the juxtaposition of knowing that she is selfish and yet also self-aware. And we needed those mirrors for her to understand and realize that people are telling her things that she already knows. It's not anything was new information to her. She's already aware that she needs to get it together. And I think that that sort of writing that fine line of of knowing what you're doing and knowing and not knowing how to stop was, I think, the most painful and, and the most interesting part to me. So many people can tell you to get it together, but until you know how or you have the tools, you can't. And I really wanted her character to not be let off the hook in a way where she, she she's she's knowledgeable enough to know that they're they're right. One of the other scenes that I really loved too is when Ethan is telling Riley, he's like, "I wish I could, you know, just give you my eyeballs and you could see yourself the way I see you." And that's sort of one of the coping mechanisms that I use a lot is if I'm doing a lot of negative self talk to talk to myself, you know, like I'm a friend or my younger self because I would never talk to my younger self as a little like I would never talk to my friends like that I would never talk to a young girl in the way that I talk to myself um so I'm curious if that's one of my mechanisms that I use but I'm curious what are sort of what are the mental health tips or strategies or mantras that you use or tell yourself to navigate your mental health sure I mean I think that scene in particular is really sad to me because what I think a lot of people don't realize is that he's actually doing a disservice to her by saying that he's for her to not look at herself for him to look at her and tell her what she what she looks like um that came from so many you know beautiful and I'm so grateful for the the boyfriends and people that I was with in my life who wouldn't let me fail they wanted to take it on for me um And what I needed to learn and what I think Riley needs to learn is that she's the person that has to reparent herself. She's the person that has to look in the mirror um, and and see herself correctly. And my therapist and I work a lot with uh, the gray area. Like there's no black and white thinking, which is why I put in that scene with Gina where they're all good or bad. There's just seeing it in in different perspective. Um, Oh, that's right. (laughs) That's something that, you know, I think I really, I really talk about in therapy a lot is is there's so much control that comes with black and white thinking i need to understand this so i can so i can 
have some sort of feeling of control in the situation and this means this so I can move on. But really, that's not how life works. And I think that there's a lot of duality that exists. And also the reparenting and the talking to myself like someone who who deserves to be comforted and and feeling okay about a situation. It's really hard for me. I'm 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 a big perfectionist, which I'm sure we all three are. <laughs> yeah. What gave us away? <laughs> I, don't know. I can just tell. I can just... <laughs> well, before I get into my next thing, I do want to say Emily actually does do that, and it's so funny because she doesn't talk to her friends that way. Emily is, I'm going to take a moment to hype you up, Emily, because she's the best hype woman in my life. Like, I will finish up an interview, guarantee I'll finish up this interview. I will get on the phone with her. I'll be like, oh my God, Brittany Snow hated me. Like, th- there was, I could have <laughs> phrased this differently. I could have done, and she's always like, Andy, no, like, you did great. It was so oh. fine. And whenever I'm having those moments, she will hype. So, Emily, you're great, and I love you, and I thank I you love for you. being that person. Oh my God, I, I'm so glad that this has been inspired to do this. <laughs> thank you for being so generous with your time. I, I really can't let you go, though, without asking about this because listen, Brittany, you have been in so many movies that I came up on that I rewatch all the time. We were talking before recording started. The pacifier is like A plus cinema. I <laughs> love hairspray. I like all and of Bathroom the things we're in. I came up on these movies. John Tucker must die. We need to talk about it because listen, there's word that a sequel is in the works. Jesse Metcalf is out there saying that the script involves him having a daughter. The OG cast is involved. Have you seen a script? What's going on? Please just give it to me. I need it. I, I mean, it's funny that they've, they've come out with this because I've talked to Ariel, who kind of spearheaded this a long time ago, about this at length. And we were trying to get it off the ground a couple of years ago. And, um, and I, you know, I never believe anything until I'm shooting it. Even when I was prepping Parachute, I still thought, well, it's never going to happen, you know? So maybe that's, that's a bad, uh, like, way of thinking about things. But, but, We've been talking about it for a long time, although I have not read a script. But I would love to see those girls again. I, I and Jesse, I, I love those guys. So it would be, it would be great fun. If you want to also do a sequel to The Pacifier or like a remake of that, I would look. I, I genuinely love that movie. Whenever I have like a bad lift or an Uber ride, I will get out and I will be like, land, sweet land. And really? And when, when people are doing, you know, being dramatic, I'll be like, oh, it's so dramatic. A plus line read. P.S. I just, I could fawn all over you, Brittany, and I've been oh restraining my myself thus far, but I can't anymore. Wow, that's incredible because that's the one movie that I, I truly. I mean, I think because it was my first movie, I didn't think anyone saw it. <laughs> like, I mean, I know well, I saw it in theaters. I remember going to see it in theaters. Wow. Um, that was a long, long time ago. Yes. But I, thank you. I beg you to rewatch it because it holds up. And I, I, tr- I, I know it's hard for actors to watch their own work, especially when you're a kid. And it's your first work. film. Like, I get it. I'm not I sure that was work. I don't know what I was doing. I was a teenager. But I, 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 I will guarantee you I will not watch it again. But I really love that for you. <laughs> you, know, I, you know what? I'll take one for the team. I'll rewatch it tonight on your behalf. You're so welcome, Brittany oh. Snow. Oh my gosh. Great. I love this. Thank you. <laughs> Again, thank you so much for being so generous with your time, being so open about yourself, both talking to us and just in this film. I know it's got to be daunting to put that much of yourself on a really large screen for a lot of people to see. So we loved it. We love you. And thank you for being with us today, Brittany. You're great. No, thank you so much for having me. I'm genuinely still laughing at Britney Snow going, I guarantee you I won't rewatch it, but I love that for you. I can respect that decision, but I love The Pacifier. It is genuinely such a good film. It's I learned, though, I learned recently because I was asking some of our coworkers if they've seen it because, again, A-plus film. And a lot of them are like are Gen Z or different generations, so they're either above me or below me. And I learned that for Gen Z, the equivalent of the pacifier was the game plan or the tooth fairy, both movies with the rock. And I remember the game plan. I haven't seen tooth fairy in a long time, but I remember the game plan. So I love learning what what movies are are the uh, touchstones for generations. But for me, man, it is the pacifier. I love that movie. Yeah. If she doesn't want to rewatch it, she is missing out because that was a gold A plus film. Yes. I I'm going to go watch it this weekend now. I have with the pup. Good. Up. I think, and I love learning, you know, all of her, you know, mental health tips. And after we edited, you know, we're kind of like talking about it. it was a therapy session and it really was. Yeah. And wait, Emily, I have a question though. You mentioned during that interview that one of our guests recommended journaling. Who was that? Why am I blanking? Yes. Okay. So that was Camille Mendez. You were here. not, you were not, you were not here. So I took that interview 
Camilla Mendez. Check out that episode. She's also amazing. We also dove deep into mental health. And one of the things she really recommends is journaling. So I tried it and it worked and I recommend it. So this is what you do when I can't make an interview with you. You get really good mental health tips and then you just hoard them for yourself. Actually, you didn't hoard them because they're in the episode. So that's just me being lazy, I guess. That that one's on me. That is an Andy problem. I will take responsibility for that. But I'm glad it's working for you, genuinely. I have a lot of energy today, Emily. I'm sorry. You just gotta... I, I love it. Well, definitely, these are mental health tips that help, with, help us. Feel free to share your own mental health tips, any mantras you have that you think work. Feel free to comment, share them, slide into our DMs. You can follow us at The Wrap. You can follow Wrap Women on Instagram at Wrap Women and on Twitter at The Wrap Women. And you can follow us as well. I am at Emily Vogel, please, on TikTok and Instagram. And Andy, I'll throw it over to you. On Instagram, I'm at really underscore Andy. And then on TikTok, I'm just at really Andy. Thank you all so much for joining us. And we look forward to next time. Bye, guys. Have a good one.